So welcome to Social Media Week 2016. <laughs> Fifth annual event. Um, so this is one of the only times that you students are gonna hear, please use your cell phones, okay? So feel free to tweet, post, um, share as much content as possible because we wanna start and kick off the week um, in a really big way. Um, we're using the event hashtag, hashtag UTSMW16. So please use that um, whenever you're sharing all of your content. We're super excited today to have an alum come back to present. Uh, Laura Brown is here from Politico. And Laura is gonna speak on the topic, a newsfeed divided, how the digital re revolution is changing our politics. And we have two wonderful UT so Social Media Week ambassadors, Carly Kirkpatrick and Madison Duke that are here to introduce Laura very quickly. Laura Brown followed a lifelong passion for politics and technology to Washington, D.C. shortly after graduation. She now manages analytics and operations for the audience solutions team at Politico, one of the fastest growing media companies in the United States. In 2015, she was named to Folio's 30 under 30 list of industry innovators. She has also been named the world's greatest detective by a coffee mug that sits on her desk. So with all that said, please welcome Laura Brown. Um, I'm really excited to be here. This is a bit of a bucket list item for me. Um, so I just want to say a quick thank you to Dr. Childers and the whole Social Media Week team for their hospitality. Um, and uh, also, while I'm up here with the mic, um, I've had a little bit of real world experience by now. And I do truly believe that the skill set I got from this program um, has been tremendously valuable, not just to my career, but to my employer's bottom lines. Um, and so I just this is one of the best programs in the country, and I hope everybody recognizes that. Um, so I graduated from UT in 2010 from the ad program and moved up to Washington, where I've been for the most part ever since. Uh, this picture is Obama's 2012 inauguration, 2013 inauguration. Um, I had a brief stint in Baltimore that I don't really like to talk about. So I spent two years working at CQ Roll Call, which is basically the college newspaper of Capitol Hill. And then I jumped to Politico, where I've been for the past three years. Politico is an independent news site that covers politics. Um, if you're not familiar with it, I highly recommend that you check it out, because it's pretty awesome, if I do say so myself. Um, so my job there is a lot of things, but partially what I do is I study the behaviors and patterns of people that read about politics on the internet. And we use those insights to come up with revenue-generating strategies and strategic communications strategies. So I'm here today to talk to you a little bit, and I know that it's a Monday morning, so um, to talk to you a little bit about how the internet is disrupting politics. And it's a timely discussion because the only thing predictable about the 2016 election so far is how unpredictable it is. Um, it seems a little bit like every day we're careening headfirst towards the most contentious general election in modern American history. Um, and it feels a little bit like it's the final season of America the TV show and the writers are just throwing in every subplot that they've ever thought of, right? <laughs> so, in order to provide some context, I want to back up a little bit. Um, because the internet is sort of its own entity, and so to understand how it's affecting politics, we sort of have to understand it as its own mechanism. And so let's take a step back um, and talk about a day that happened before this election even started. Um, we're going to jump back to February 26, 2015, which is a date that I have picked completely arbitrarily and not at all because it totally makes my point. <laughs> February 26 was a Thursday, and it was a pretty big deal for the internet. Um, it started in the morning when the Federal Communications Commission announced that they were classifying the internet as a public utility effectively enacting what is called net neutrality. And what that means is that your internet provider cannot increase or decrease your connection speed based on what you're doing on the internet. So Netflix or Comcast can't get into a business feud with Netflix and then decrease your internet connection in retaliation. As far as actual big deal things that happened to the internet on February 26th, that was probably the biggest. The FCC generated 200 
a thousand a day. And then the internet sort of got a little bit slap happy with its new freedom. It started, the party started with two fugitives who cut loose from a retirement facility in Phoenix. There's no sound. Hold on. I don't know why there's no sound. It did work when we tested it. Sorry about this. There we go. All right, so two fugitives have escaped from Phoenix, Arizona, from a retirement home in Phoenix. And Louise, they were bored together in the suburbs. But these were no ordinary outlaws, and reining them in was an easy task. NBC's Miguel Almaguer, Wild. In Sun City today, this may have been the very definition of the Wild West a slow, sometimes high speed pursuit of two llamas on the loose, breaking away from their owners, at times from each other, seizing their moment and their shot at freedom. Something you don't see every day. We'll keep an eye on this, folks. The two-hour chase carried live on local, even cable news. This wild tale dubbed Llamas on the Lamb. The llama drama trending on Twitter. The Arizona Cardinals agree to one-year deals with Llamas on the Loose. The llama chase, the biggest since OJ. It's gotten wild out west before. We've seen bears in backyards running from the law. There goes Mama climbing up to get her baby. Look at that. Ducks have made a dash, or at least a slow waddle along the freeway. And a moose on the loose brought traffic to a standstill. But this was llamas. Llamas. At one point, one of the deputies was trying to capture a llama with the crime scene tape. Like most getaways, it didn't end well for the suspects. Running out of breath and time, they were lassoed by modern-day cowboys. A good run while it lasted. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Los Angeles. So my favorite part of that is the image of a sheriff trying to lasso a llama with some crime scene tape. Um, so the llama situation was like primed to go viral, right? Like you guys are laughing, it's because it's pretty hilarious. Um, and so that generated 220,000 tweets on Twitter during the two hours that the llamas were on the loose. Um, and so the llamas got caught, as are want to do. And the next thing that happened is something that probably everybody in this room will recognize on February 26, 2015. And that is the dress that broke the internet. And isn't that always the case? As soon as you set something free, it breaks. What color is this dress? OK, hold on. Raise your hand if you think that it's blue and black. OK, raise your hand if you think it's white and gold. OK, this dress is definitely white and gold, except it's actually, in reality, blue and black. Um, the first week after this posted, it generated 10 million tweets answering that question. To put that into some context, that's 2 thirds of the total amount of tweets that Super Bowl 50 got. And it turns out, 10 million tweets is a pretty big data set for scientists to analyze. And so they did just that. And what they found. Um, people that research color and vision, is that 57% of people see the dress as black and blue, 30% see the dress as white and gold, and 10% sort of have the ability to switch between the two because they're crazy. And then like another 10% or so or whatever is left uh, see it as like brown and black or brown and blue or whatever the different colors are. Um, they also discovered that women we're more likely to see the dress as white and gold than men. And the older you are, the more likely you are to see the dress as white and gold. What was so great about the dress is that it was a debate in the purest form. The color that you see when you look at a dress 
is based completely on the rods and cones in your eyes and how they send information to your brain. That's it. It doesn't involve your socioeconomic status or your race or your gender or your religion or anything other than this is the raw way that my brain processes information. But most debates that we have as people are not so simple because we do have to start including all of those layers. And once we start layering on all of that other stuff, things start to get a little bit cloudy. Who we are is based off of millions of tiny data points. What color you see when you look at a dress, how old you are, where you grew up, how healthy you are, what job you do, who you go home to, even what presidential election was happening when you first started to pay attention to the world. All of these little experiences and idiosyncrasies and unique things about us actually shape the way that our brains process the worlds around us. These filters have a name in psychology. They're called schema. And since I'm not a psychologist, um, these people that I'm about to play can give you an example better than I can. Most of the factors that predict whether or not something that is being perceived will also be remembered operate in the first few seconds of learning. One of these factors involves something termed a schema and whether or not the new learning bumps into one. Let me show you an example of a schema by having Dr. Whitehead and myself read a paragraph to you, one actually taken from a famous research paper. Your job is to remember as many facts about the paragraph as you can. Let me tell you in advance that you are going to fail miserably at this task unless I do something first. I can instantly improve your memory score from between 50 to 100% simply by adding seven little words before you hear Dr. Whitehead and myself. But I'm not going to do that. You will hear the paragraph first, then I will read you the words. The procedure is actually quite simple. First, you arrange things into different groups. Of course, one pile may be sufficient depending on how much there is to do. If you have to go somewhere else due to lack of facilities, that is the next step. Otherwise, you are pretty well set. It is important not to overdo things. That is, it is better to do too few things at once than too many. In the short run, this might not seem important, but complications can easily arise. A mistake can be expensive as well. After the procedure is completed, one arranges the materials into different groups again. Then they can be put into their appropriate places. Eventually, they'll be used once more in the whole cycle or have to be repeated. However, that is a part of life. Did you get all that? No? Let us give you now the seven magic little words. This paragraph is all about washing clothes. What that sentence provides for you is a mental framework, a way of organizing thoughts around some aspect of the world. We call such frameworks schemas, and you have them about people, situations, objects. This means something profound. Prior knowledge can disturbingly shape how you memorize and retain for long-term storage future knowledge. If a schema is triggered near the moment of learning, that learning is more permanent. Brain rules. <laughs> They're cute. So our brains have evolved this process over time in order to help us get better at organizing and process information, to help make future situations and information processing easier. Or to put it a different way, it helps us take the million different things that we see and do and hear and say in any given day, and it helps us provide some context so that we know what to remember and what not to remember. It's sort of like how Sleepless in Seattle is only a romantic comedy because of the music that plays in the background and not a crazy stalker movie. Glad you guys laughed at that. I was worried it was a little bit too old. So our schema are based on a lifetime of experience interacting with the world around us. And by definition, we as people are more likely to notice things that fit in with our schema. And when we run into things that don't, we tend to discount them as exceptions to the rule instead of changing our schema in the face of contradictory information. <clears throat> and so take all of these truths about our individuality and how it shapes our experience and put it on the internet. So similar to how our brains have evolved schema to help us process new information, the internet has developed algorithms to filter information. And these algorithms are necessary because there is so much information generated on the internet in any given day. This is a graphic from Domo, which is a leading business intelligence tool. 
Um, and one of the things that it shows, or all of the things that it shows, is this is how much information is generated every minute of the day on these platforms. And so YouTube users upload 72 hours of new video every minute. Facebook users share 2,460,000 items every minute. Email users send 204 million messages every minute. And so it follows that we need to be able to filter the web because it would be basically useless without it. And so similar to how our brains have evolved schema to help us process new information, the internet has developed algorithms. And how the digital algorithms filter your online experience sort of depends on who you are as an internet person. So this person also has filters. They're shaped around your daily activities, both on and off the web. And some of these filters are self-assessed. You actively choose who you follow or friend, what subreddits you subscribe to, what blogs you put in your RSS feed. So in many ways, our individual internet experiences are very much of our own making. But there's an automated side to this that's often very invisible to us. Think for a second how well your internet browser would know you if it were a person. How well would it know you if it just knew the following information? How log often you log into Blackboard? You guys still use Blackboard, right? Okay. Uh, that you just set your Facebook relationship status to engage. That you just set up your LinkedIn profile. That you follow Tennessee football on Twitter. Um, that you follow Hillary Clinton on Twitter. Using just these data points, you can reasonably infer that you're probably a college student who's maybe a junior or a senior and getting ready to go out into the real world. And you can reasonably infer that maybe you're a little bit of a Democrat um, and that you like college football. But that's not all that your browser knows about you, right? Because your, what your browser is, is the place where you have confided all of your curiosities and your quest for answers. It knows who you're friends with and how often you interact with them. It knows who you follow, what you click on, what you buy, how often you log in, what your favorite sites are and how often you go to them, what topics you're interested in. And so all of the data from these filters can tell us a lot about who you are and what it is that you're likely to do in the future as an internet person. And so this data sort of dictates the way that the internet around us ends up being filtered. And since innovation follows money, generally, it's not surprising that advertisers were among the first people to figure out that they could save money by making their messaging more efficient by only targeting ads to people that were likely to be interested in their message. This makes sense the whole backbone of a good media buying strategy after all. And so how it works is this. You go to a website. There's an ad that's supposed to load on the website. The website talks to your browser and says, hey, internet, this is the type of person that I have. 22-year-old college senior who drives a car that's between 6 and 10 years old. Um, it can know maybe your household income, your relationship status, knows a whole bunch of stuff about you. And so the ad server sends that information into the cloud and it says, hey, internet, does anybody have an ad that they are interested in showing to this person? And all of the advertisers that live in this ecosystem can then bid on any one of those characteristics that it thinks are important for the opportunity to serve you an impression. And then the highest bidder wins. And all of this happens all around you all the time on the internet in like less than a hundredth of a second. It's really unbelievable. And so the whole point of this ecosystem is that it allows advertisers to target people that are most likely to engage with their message. Again, this is the whole backbone of a good media buying strategy. And in reality, it's actually usually a pretty good thing for consumers too. Because it means that when you're on the internet, the ads around you are at least somewhat relevant to you. Um, and so in theory, your entire internet experience is improved. So essentially, it just does a very good job at messing mass, mess, matching messages to audience. I'll say that 10 times fast. But the algorithms filter more than just advertising. They also affect the news and information that we see. Google filters news and search results based on what it thinks is most relevant to you. And Facebook filters your news feed based on what it thinks that you're likely to be interested in. And this includes the news stories that hit your news feed. Political campaigns are part of this too. Can, can I just comment for a second that like this CNN did this graphic and it's just really creepy and it's been all over the place this entire election. So political campaigns do this too. 
Data targeting gives them more bang for their advertising buck, and it lets them target very specific messages with very specific audiences. Campaigns now have very robust data operations that are dedicated to taking the information that you supply when you register to vote, so your address, your phone number, what party you register for, and your name, among maybe some other things. Um, and it matches that up with how often you show up at the polls, and then it matches that to your online persona. And this lets them formulate algorithms that can predict how likely you are to show up at, polls on, at the polls on election day, among some other things. Recent estimates suggest that the use of this database and algorithm platforms can affect a candidate's results in the final tally by two to three percentage points. The Cruz campaign is probably the best at this, this cycle. They've hired a team of behavioral psychologists to take your internet persona and map it out to what is essentially your Myers-Briggs personality type. And then from there, it layers on some additional things that it's gathered that you're interested in. And it can sort you into categories like, and this is just a few of them, relaxed leader and temperamental conservative and stoic traditionalist. Then it uses this data to determine which messages you might be most receptive to. So if it's determined that you're a temperamental conservative, mm, I should do this in order. If it's determined that you're a true believer, you might respond better to a message about Ted Cruz's faith. If you're a stoic traditionalist, you may respond better to a message about immigration. If you're a temperamental conservative, you might respond to a message <laughs> about Ted Cruz and the Second Amendment. And it's not just online advertising tailor this way. They also use it to instruct the volunteers that they send to go door to door in efforts to get out the vote on how to talk to you. So this is how that works. A campaign volunteer, before she walks up to your house, has an app on her phone, and since you've provided your address when you've registered to vote, she can run your address through the database, and the database will tell her which script to follow when you answer the door. Now, if our online behavior is going to now tie back to our real life self, this sort of calls into question. Is who we are on the internet an accurate depiction of who we are in the real world? So yes and no. The line is a little bit blurry here. The internet determines the way that you publicly display your best self as well as all of the things that you search for in the middle of the night when you're not able to sleep. So in that sense, we're very good at predicting behavior because we just have so much data to sort through. And that means we're able to pull very strong statistical correlations among human populations. So for example, taking only the things that you like on Facebook, we're able to accurately predict a wide range of personal attributes. Things like sexual orientation, religion, political leaning, personality, intelligence, even whether or not your parents are divorced. And the things that are used on Facebook to predict this behavior are not always obvious. <laughs> the best predictors for high intelligence are liking the pages for thunderstorms, the Colbert Report, science, and curly fries. We'll get back to that. Best predictors for male heterosexuality are the Wu-Tang Clan. Uh, Martin Shkreli is very validated by that. Shaq, science, and being confused after waking up from naps. So curly fries doesn't really match closely with high intelligence, does it? So it turns out that the Facebook page for curly fries was created by somebody who was pretty intelligent. And since we're all likely in our social circles to be friends with people who share the co same common attributes as us, with his smart friends who shared it with their smart friends. And so it's not liking the page for curly fries that is the predictor of high intelligence. It's that so many other intelligent people like the page for curly fries that it makes it statistically likely that you are high intelligent, highly intelligent as well. So theoretically, you wouldn't otherwise know that the page exists, except you know, unless you just like curly fries and you search for curly fries to like it on Facebook, in which case, I can't really help you. A University of Essex study in 2013 concluded that the mere presence of a mobile phone Mm. in an environment makes us more distracted. It physically takes over a small part of our attention, and this makes us feel less connected to each other. It makes us less present for each other. When we do things face-to-face, -face, like apologize or break up with someone or ask them out on a date, 
or able to have a shared emotional experience. You ask somebody out, for example, you have to speak through your nerves and you can see the other person's face light up in acceptance or look away in rejection. And then you have to modify your behavior accordingly. So empathy is an important thing for us to have as people. We're required to use it to appropriately recognize and handle the emotional reactions of the people around us. So too often, when we do things over the internet that we would otherwise do face to face, we're not really required to think about the emotional consequences of our words. And we're certainly not required to deal with them in real time. And so the internet doesn't really have a mechanism to force us to modify our behavior to account for the feelings of someone else. And so the mere act of doing something on a device that you would otherwise do face to face strips out some of our empathy. And empathy is important because being able to connect with each other and put ourselves in someone else's shoes is a quintessential piece of what it means to be a human. And it's certainly one of the things that is needed for us to have an effective and functioning democracy. And so it follows that this alone maybe makes us a little less inclined to be kind to each other on the internet. And so maybe our internet personas are not always what we want directly tied to our lives. Let's stop for a second and answer any questions if anybody has them. OK. So let's talk about the modern news environment for a bit. It's a little bit of a pivot. Started, started micro, and now we're going we're gonna to step back a little bit. So it's easy for us in 2016 to assume that the role of journalism is to be objective. But the inherent bias of the media as a whole tracks strongly with the methods of distribution of the news. And the distribution strategy of the news is highly dependent on how media organizations make money, because they're businesses, after all. <coughs> And so in the early days of America, newspapers were actually financed by the government and political parties. And their whole purpose was to be a mouthpiece for party politics. In fact, it wasn't until the 20th century that the news media was financially incentivized towards objectivity. And this shift is largely due to a shift in business model. They realized that they can make money on subscriptions and advertising. And that means that money is to be made by keeping as many people happy as possible. And to do that, newspapers had to be objective. And so in the 21st century, the internet is rapidly changing the traditional revenue streams of media, like rapidly. Most newspapers have seen their print subscriptions and advertising revenue tank. For most sites on the internet, money is to be made based on the amount of traffic that a site can get, which means the media isn't really incentivized towards objectivity. It's incentivized to get you to click on things. And so if the methods of distribution are so important to the media's role in our lives, how are people getting political news in 2016? So 91% of US adults are paying attention to the 2016 election in any given week. And actually, I read this this weekend, the Washington Post came out with a study, the more people are paying attention, the less likely they feel like they want to vote. <laughs> yep. So if you look at this, Cable news comes in at 24% as far as resources that people cite as being the most helpful. But if you add up all of the things in this column that are associated with the internet, so social media, news website, email, candidate website, it actually comes in higher than cable news. It's actually about 30%. And among those people that get their political news on the internet, 48% of them cite Facebook as one of the most crucial sources to them. This gap is generational. 61% of millennials claim they get their politics and government news from Facebook in any given week. This trend is not reflected among baby boomers. They still prefer to get their news from more traditional channels. However, this doesn't make boomers much better because when boomers do get their news from Facebook, they're much more likely to only see things that are in line with their ideology. And so what are the things that we click on on the internet? One, we click on things that we already agree with, things that fit into our predetermined schema. Two, we click on things that make us feel the most feelings, um, either direction, right? So anger and anxiety on one end and laughter and wonder and happiness on the other. The more emotion something makes us feel, the more likely we are to click on it. Next, we're pretty likely to click on things like hyperbole and superlative. This is the reason the clickbait does so well. These are headlines that promise to blow your mind. And finally, numbers and lists. Um, these sort of help our brains 
process information better. We're just predisposed to enjoy reading a thing in a list form. And in addition to pre being predisposed to click on things that make us particularly emotional, there's also the issue of similarity. So if you tend to click on articles about conservative politics, that signals to the algorithm that you're likely to click on things that lean to the right. And if you like to click on stories about liberal politics, that signals to the algorithms that you're likely to click on things that lean to the left. And so over time, even though we have more have access to more information than ever before, we're shown mostly stuff that we're already predisposed to agree with, that's predisposed to make us emotional, and this limits our exposure to things that might challenge our preconceived views. Plus, people are creatures of habit. So just naturally, we tend to limit the things that we read in any given day. So all of this is, has a name. It's called the filter bubble. And this is an emerging field of study in internet algorithms. A filter bubble is basically a digital echo chamber of confirmation bias. And it serves to make us more sure that our singular view of the world is the correct one. I should mention that Facebook especially is paying high attention to this, mostly because they're the biggest perpetrators. And in their own internal research, they've found that who you're friends with and what you share tends to be slightly more indicative of your filter bubble than the Facebook algorithm directly. However, Facebook commissioned the study, and it's not really it's not able easily able to easily replicate. That's the word I want. Um, and the Facebook filter study also said so the effect of algorithm in filtering news is stronger for liberals than conservatives. But when presented with news that contains opposing views, conservatives click a lot less than liberals. And probably the most important piece, only 7% of the content that's clicked on on Facebook is considered hard news. What hard news is, is the stuff that's relevant to the world around you, right? So a fire in a refugee camp in Syria would be considered hard news. 21 pictures of a cute dog jumping into a river would be considered soft news. So only 7% of the stuff that we click in in Facebook is hard news. And so science is still trying to determine exactly how pronounced this effect is and in what capacities it exists. But one thing that seems very clear is that political news, specifically, seems to be one of the most polarizing topics on the entire internet. Pew Research, who I'm going to quote a lot here, does a lot of research around journalism and, and the people that interact with it. And so it mapped out the different connections and networks created by different types of Twitter conversations. And it found that political discussions on Twitter specifically tend to feature two big and distinct groups with little connection between them. These two groups are not on Twitter arguing with each other. They're on Twitter completely ignoring each other's existence. They point to different sets, sites on the web. They use completely different hashtags. They have very little reason to even know that the other one exists. Pew's also found that the number of people who hold consistent conservative or consistent liberal ideologies has doubled in the past 25 years. And that is important because the people who fit into these categories of consistent ideology tend to be the ones who make their voices heard the loudest through every stage of the political process. It turns out that squeaky wheels tend to tweet a lot. And not only that, but the research has shown that the stronger your ideology is, the more likely you are to limit your social circles only to people who already agree with you. And so we know people who are consistently strong in one ideology or the other are becoming polarized much faster than those in the middle. Partisan animosity has also increased. The share of people who believe that the opposing party's policies are so misguided that they threaten the nation's well-being has more than doubled since 1994. So it really shouldn't be that much of a surprise that it often feels like on the internet we're arguing in two completely separate universes. Because we basically are. I'm sorry that this graph does not move faster. So this is the polarization of the American public 
up to 2000, I think it's up to 2014. We are more polarized right now than we have been at any point since the American Civil War. This chart measures the voting patterns of Congress, right, and how likely each chamber of Congress is to vote strictly along party lines. The higher the line is, the more likely that chamber is to be pretty ideologically consistent. So if you see it, the House especially is like way up there. So to recap, people are increasingly getting political news from the internet, especially our age demographic. The share of people who have strong, consistently conservative or consistently liberal ideologies is increasing. Polarization is happening faster among these people because they are more likely to limit their social groups. And our government is more polarized than at any point into the Civil War. It's the Civil War. This is the news, it's alerts, 140 character sound bites from sources the same way that we do. We're not so encouraged to have discussions in the real world anymore. We're encouraged to leave our political discussions online, like in the Facebook, where it's emotionally easier to have them, and we don't have to care so much what the emotional effect of our words are on what somebody else might be thinking or feeling. And this, all of this, this whole presentation of is having a huge effect on the internet's evolving role as the town square of our democracy. Because the town square, it's where questions come on our level. So this internet is doing its disruption in the political space. So 2008, which was a really, really cool time to be in college, was a social media election. First election in history where it played a major role in the outcome. Barack Obama was the first candidate to heavily engage with people through their online social networks. His campaign spent over $16 million on online advertising in 2008, compared to McCain's camp, which spent a fraction of that at $3.6 million. 2012 was the election. The first types of African data targeting, a candidate went in. Obama spent $52 million in online advertising during his 2012 campaign. This is double the amount spent by Mitt Romney. 2016, when all is said and done, and believe me when I tell you that this is going to be one of the most elections in America. Here's the selling election. Candidate success is dependent on our ability to hold the media. Donald Trump is a master at this, like unbelievable master. He uses social in a way that no candidate ever has before. He can get our attention and then he can maintain it in a world of short attention spans and it often doesn't even matter what it is he has to say. His tendency, if you pay attention, to say some of his more outrageous things Typically, it will coincide with a moment in the polls when his relative popularity is down. This is assuredly on purpose. He seems to have complete control over his place in the news cycle, regardless of what the news has to say about it. And this style of politicking has gained him over $2 billion in earned media since last June, according to the New York Times. $2 billion. To put that into some context, if that were advertising spend, it would be two and a half times the total amount of money spent on Barack Obama's 2012 campaign as a whole, like not just online, that includes TV and, and, and everything. So the public is more engaged in the election than they have been at this point in either of the two past presidential cycles, which is a kind of a big deal because 2008 was kind of a big deal. And frankly, Donald Trump is great for those of us in the business of media. Either because people passionately support him or because they feel like they're watching a train that's on fire and careening fast towards the Grand Canyon, people can't help but click. Political sites like mine are seeing unprecedented and sustained traffic surges 
unlike anything that we have ever seen before. TV broadcasts are in record ratings for televised debate, debates. Les Moonves, the chairman of CBS, who's got the goofy smile on the screen, has been quoted several times over the past few months saying something along the lines of, it may not be good for America, but it's damn good for CBS. The money's rolling in, and this is fun. I've never seen anything like this, and this is going to be a very good year for us. I'm sorry, it's a terrible thing to say, but bring it on, Donald. <laughs> it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation, right? Media and Donald Trump because people are rapidly clicking on stories about Donald Trump. On the other hand, people are rapidly clicking on stories about Donald Trump because the media keeps covering Donald Trump. It's a whole field of study, I think, that's going to emerge out of this election. Donald's not the only candidate who's particularly good at using social. Bernie Sanders has the Reddit narrative locked down. Are there any Redditors in here? Yeah, OK. Uh, unrelated, if you leave here and you move away, Reddit is a great place to meet people. <laughs> An analysis by Pew showed that Sanders is far and away the most frequently mentioned candidate on Reddit. Articles about Bernie are much more likely to make it to the front page than articles about any other candidate. And this makes sense, because the average Redditor is between the ages of 18 to 29 and tends to be male and tends to be more liberal. And this makes Reddit pretty much the perfect place for Bernie Sanders to connect with his target audience. And so all of this puts a significant value on the technologies and data that tracks the political pulse of the national conversation on the internet. And so we have several ways of doing this. First, the number of tweets that something gets is usually a pretty good measure of its place in the national conversation. Second, so this dashboard from the Associated Press throws in Google and Twitter, and it shows how much people are interested in things based on a baseline. And their baseline here is how much people were talking about the Iowa caucuses at the beginning of February. Uh, and so if you're looking at it, I pulled this this morning, so it's, it's up to date. Um, People are less interested in the election, probably because it's holiday weekend. Tweet volume is down, too, um, at least compared to the Iowa caucus. It also monitors Google search interest drivers, which basically takes the total number of times that candidates are searched for, and it puts it in relation to a rolling average. So Donald Trump is up 3% over the past 24 hours to his rolling average. Bernie Sanders is down 17%. Ted Cruz is down 28%. We do the same thing for topics. So there's a 131% increase in the gun show loophole over the past 24 hours. Also, the Syrian civil war, healthcare in the United States, Iran US relations, uh, global warming. Global warming's not been a big topic, so I'm actually surprised to see that on the list. And usually, these search interest issue drivers correlate with what is going on in the rest of the world. That makes sense. They do this on Twitter, too. So Donald Trump is up 3% on Google. He's down 3% on Twitter, maybe because it was a holiday weekend. Same thing for Bernie Sanders. He was down 23% in Google searches and 46% in Twitter searches. And the most mentioned issues on Twitter are national security. This makes sense. That's usually what happens when there's a terrorist attack somewhere in the world. We had two over the course of the past week. Energy and environment is down 4%. Economy is up a little bit. Gun issues are down. So you kind of get a feeling for what it is that people on the internet are talking about at any given point. 538, which is run by the pollster Nate Silver, who is famous because he correctly predicted the 2012 election, mapped out locations to Facebook likes. And so this pulls in important insights into where in the country certain candidates are doing better than others on the internet. Now, 538 will be the first to caveat that Facebook likes are not the same thing as votes. And so this data set is more of a visual tool for overall popularity than it is actual election data. But if you look at it, Bernie Sanders tends to do great in urban areas and college towns. Donald Trump tends to do great everywhere else in the country. And then Ted Cruz has Texas, because that's where he's from. And it's a little sad if you can't win your own home state. Mm -hmm. 
And I should also mention that Donald Trump has been famous for a very long time. And so we don't know if all of these likes came because he's running for president or if some of them existed just because he ran The Apprentice. So I've already mentioned that how media companies on the internet are making money is a really important piece of the equation here. Because typically, money follows traffic. And so Facebook and Google are starting to hold not only the methods of distribution of content, but also the content itself. Publishers are now being incentivized to publish their content directly within these platforms so that you as the user will never have to click away from your social network at all. This consolidates a tremendous amount of power into relatively few companies. And so this makes the tech companies that we trust with our data extremely valuable and extremely powerful because they're rapidly gaining the power to completely shape the world that we live in. Foreign Policy Magazine provided this graphic, um, determined that Facebook, Apple, Twitter, Amazon, Microsoft, and Alphabet, which is Google, are now more powerful than some countries. This is both because of their annual revenues and because of the power that we entrust in them to protect our data and use it in appropriate ways. In fact, if you look at Apple alone, its cash in hand exceeds the GDP of two thirds of the world's countries. So we know that the internet strips away some of our ability to empathize. We know that stories that do best are the ones that make us emotional. We know that we partially live in a world where our opinions aren't challenged. And we know that power is being increasingly consolidated into a few of the top players. So how do we work to fight this? So I think an emerging field of thought over the next decade or so is going to be in coming up with a type of algorithmic ethics where the companies and watchdog organizations pay attention to the effects that their algorithms are having on internet populations. And they work to create a more integrated internet. Because what happens to the stories that we don't necessarily like, but that are important to the public good? How does a story about a fire in a refugee camp break through a news cycle about the latest Kanye Twitter rant? Yeah, yeah. How do the things that we need to see break through the things that we want to see? Unrelated, Kanye's tweet about suit jackets is like my favorite Kanye tweet of all time. So I'm not the only one who's noticed all of these things, and thank God, because otherwise this presentation would have been impossible to pull together. And so luckily, all of the companies that I've mentioned seem to have an awareness of their corporate responsibility here. This thing I'm really excited about just got released from Alphabet's Jigsaw team. And the Jigsaw team is there to create tools that help journalists better report on the world. Uh, it also helps with some cybersecurity issues. This tool tells you what topics were outside of the filter bubble for your country. And it helps us to design algorithms to fight them. So imagine if we could use this technology to actually algorithmically define our individual filter bubble and then purposefully break it. The internet is the biggest tool discovered or created by the human species. In its historical significance, it's on par with the ability to make fire and the wheel in how it's fundamentally changing who we are as a species. We now have the ability to access news and information from all over the world with just a click of a button. Anyone with an idea and some words is now a content generator. Breaking news events happen in real time on Twitter. We use the internet to learn. We use it to trade, to earn a living. We use it to meet a mate. We use it to participate in our government. And since the internet has become the new town square where we as communities are having complex discussions about the future, but we're doing it without having to deal with the emotional reactions of each other. So we're losing our ability to empathize with each other, which means that we're losing our ability to get a broader picture of the world that we live in. Democracy only works if citizens are able to think beyond their own narrow self-interests. And so to do that, we have to be able to have a shared 360 degree view of the world we live in. We need to be able to recognize and come to terms with 
other people's lives and needs and desires. The internet kind of seems to be pushing us in the opposite direction of this. It creates this false impression that the world around us is all about us. And while this is especially good for getting people to buy things on the internet, it's not super great for people who are trying to make decisions about the type of democracy that they want to live in. And when we live in such isolated information bubbles, it makes the truth seem relative and cherry-picked. And it leaves us susceptible, more susceptible, to being lied to and manipulated. So in closing, I leave you with this. Be aware of how your own internet habits are contributing to your information consumption. To quote Eli Pariser, who writes a great book on this, the more we're able to interrogate how these algorithms work and what effects they have, the more we're able to shape our own information destinies. Next, purposefully seek out articles that you disagree with. And don't shy away from arguments with people around you that disagree with you. It's usually, those arguments help you. And finally, when all of you graduate and you go out into the real world, you're going to have to deal with a lot of really cool emerging technologies that exist in the ad tech space. So be aware of the broader implications of the technologies that you're going to work with, because the effects are things that we're all going to have to live with. And that is the end, if anybody has any questions. Um, so the like New York Times keeps posting stuff about Donald Trump mm -hmm. and like we've all heard like there's no such thing as bad publicity so they're obviously making him more popular yes so would you say that that's actually coming from like they don't care and they're just gonna keep posting negative material or is it kind of like in the end the same way with the guy from CBS like they know that it's just gonna bring them in money and they don't really care if it's like not really helping further their agenda so most media organizations have, or at least the ones that are like more reputable, so like the New York Times, Washington Post, Politico is part of that group, have a pretty strict firewall between what their editorial team does and what their business team like is incentivized to do. And so I think it's a little bit of both in that like the business side really appreciates all of the incoming traffic. Um, I don't think those decisions, especially on the level of the New York Times, are dictating anything that the editorial team is doing. It's sort of a broader conversation um, that the media industry is having right now, and I don't, I don't think, like, I don't have any insights that are going to be particularly insightful on it. Um, yeah, it's kind of something you yeah. have to like be inside there to know, but it's just strange to me because he's popular because of the people who are making him that way, you know. And I mean, I think a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, he's also popular. Um, because of the things that he says, right. right? Like, I think he'd be popular on his own, and the media sort of just populates it. So, I don't know. It's a good question, and it's one that people are like actively studying and, and talking about. Um, I can, I'll tweet out some links on that that you can read afterwards. Thank you. <coughs> Over here. I have a question about the algorithms and advertisements because so if ad revenue generates. I mean, because they're interested in targeting people who are a specific demographic or whatever. Mm -hmm. So if the algorithms help to specify that person, then by diversifying them to you, so you would like get content that you don't necessarily agree with, but like ethically maybe it would be good for mm -hmm. you to know more about, how would, I guess, how would advertisers respond to that? Because then they would be reaching people who might not necessarily care about their products. So. The advertising ecosystem is moving to a place where it operates independently of the content that people are reading. So you as an advertiser can target whoever you think you want to target, so whoever's in your target market, and it's not really relevant to what content that they're reading. Um, so like it's sort of a, it's like a trading system environment or ecosystem that exists on the internet and, and websites put their inventory in it and people bid on it and it's not really related specifically to the content. Right, right. That happens too, yeah. but not for the purpose that I'm talking about. Maybe. You 
mentioned, you mentioned algorithmic ethics, and you seem to indicate, I think in passing, that there was maybe a glimmer of hope that things mm -hmm. were changing. Um, but it seems that the way algorithms are cr structured now is directly tied to um, boosting revenue. Uh, so how do you undo that tie? If, if and are there, it, you know, is that happening? And if so, how is that happening? Because, you know, when it's sh these are shareholder or public companies, it's it's very hard to talk about ethics. It is really hard to talk about it. Um, and I think we have to start working within the system in order to change it. Um, and so part of that's going to be purposefully designing algorithms designed to catch this. Um, Again, this is a topic that's like under pretty strong discussion among the media community. Uh, and so there will be a lot of stuff that I think that comes out of it, especially out of the 2016 election, because this is sort of the culmination of all of this tech is like led to this media environment that we see right now. And um, it's caught a lot of people by surprise. And so figuring out how to work within the system in order to change it is going to be one of the major drivers, I think, moving forward. So is there a conversation, uh, along the ethics side, is there a conversation in the industry about um, privacy rights? Because the data that they're collecting very, very well may be an intrusion in our privacy. Yes. Particularly on the political side. Polit particularly on the political side. So Europe is, Europe uh, is doing a lot of stuff around that, around privacy and the internet and what data you're allowed to collect. Europe has an opt-in system. US hasn't really caught up. Um, I think that's a reluctance on the part of regulators to regulate um, internet collection. Um, the FTC likes to encourage the industry to self-regulate. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if over the next 12 to 18 months, we see Congress start to really look at coming up with laws in which to regulate the system. In this world, the ecosystem, as you described it, where um, the advertiser is buying the um, consumer independent of content, how does an organization that exists to create content differentiate itself so that the advertiser wants to buy space on Politico rather than just go straight to Google or Facebook? Oh, that's a question. So there's, there's two sort of separate like advertising revenue strategies that seem to exist among media. One is um, people that take all of their inventory and they just put it into that online system and they just let it work. And then whatever, however the revenue shakes out at the end of the month, like that's what the revenue is. I mean, there are like ways you can go in and optimize it, but uh, you know, as, as far as actual like labor intensive, it's you know you just sort of let it go. The other is um, so sponsored content is a thing that is uh, making work news organizations a lot of money. Um, directly selling like sponsorships of content. So we have a huge long-standing partnership with J.P. Morgan Chase that sponsors a series of ours called What Works that looks at city innovations in America that are working particularly well and how those insights can be extrapolated and transferred to other places. And so advertisers have the ability to still align with good content if that's what they decide that their media strategy should be. And I think that there are a lot of advertisers that that should be their media strategy. Um, so it sort of kind of depends on like what your goals are and what it is that you're trying to do. Um, media organizations still kind of trying to figure out the puzzle. Um, a few of them are further along than others. but. So when I was a communication director on the Hill, we only had roll call in the Hill. And Politico was this new thing that everybody said was going to come and die. And people who went and took jobs there, it was like, oh, you poor thing. <laughs> and now they like ate everybody else. Yes. And they're winning, right? Like big time. So one of, the, one of the pieces I remember was that roll call on the Hill, from an outsider perspective on the Hill, seemed like they weren't really willing to innovate. They weren't. They were sticking with their column of herd on the hill, and you know it was kind of that old school model. So I wondered if you could just give us some kind of insider baseball ideas about the culture of innovation within Politico and whether or not that's just an outside observation, mm -hmm. or is it really? Does it seem like there's more of an innovative edge 
to keeping up with what consumers, news consumers want? Yeah, I mean, I think that it definitely, we are, we are definitely probably the top innovative media shop in the city. Um, I haven't worked at every media shop in the city, but I've, I've got contacts at several of them, and I definitely think that that's true. Um, my job, I'm sort of a news and like information, I'm kind of like an engineer, right? So my sales team will go out and they'll sell something, and the advertiser will say, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this? And my sales team will be like, we could do that. And then they'll come back to me and they'll be like, hey, this is what I said we could do. Can you make it happen? And so there's just a lot of, there's a lot of like freedom with which to figure out how to make different platforms work together in a way that makes the whole organization more innovative. Does that answer your question? I don't know if this is, if this is a good question, but um, I know there's a lot of, I guess I'm just wondering where is Politico keeping an eye on a lot of the security and safety concerns? I know that social media has been a huge tool, good or bad, that's been used across the board, and uh, that's been a big influence. Mm -hmm. Are you guys involved with following that? And like, is that going to be? Do you mean security, like international security, right. or like security of our office? Our international report? security. Yeah, so we have a team, we just last year or earlier, yeah, so last year now, um, launched a publication in Brussels. Uh, our office is actually about 150 feet from the metro station that blew up last week. So uh, we have a significant, significant number of reporters on the ground in Europe that are like actively monitoring the international situation over there. Um, and then in the U.S. looking at how that situation is affecting both the rhetoric around our presidential election and also like what people on the Hill are doing in the face of it. Okay, I think we're at time. We're pretty close to. Oh, I'm LB in the district on Twitter. My mom is, so LB in the district. It's a pun, kind of. So we want to tell Laura one more time, thank you so much for... Thank you.